Hello and welcome. My name is Ashley Purpura. I'm an Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Purdue University and the co-editor of the Orthodox Christianity and Contemporary Thought book series with Fordham University Press. It's my pleasure to welcome you all today to this installment of Women Scholars of Orthodox Christianity, which is one of the many initiatives of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham. The Fordham Center facilitates, funds, and publishes scholarship on the Orthodox Christian world broadly understood. To learn more about its, the center, its initiatives, or publications, please visit its website at www.fordham.edu slash orthodoxy. We also always encourage you to uh, follow the center on YouTube, click like on our programming, and share it with anyone that you think might be interested. I'm joined today uh, by our guest scholar, and I think this is the first time we've had a current Fordham faculty fellow while they're still doing the fellowship come on this series, uh, we've had some kind of later on. So I'm, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, Rayan uh, Dermaz, um, who's an assistant professor of religious studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She is a historian of religion of, in late antiquity and the middle ages. Her research interests include the literature and material culture of Syriac Christianity, hagiography and storytelling, Christian Muslim relations and communal identities in the medieval Middle East. Her first book, Stories Between Christianity and Islam, Saints, Memory, and Cultural Exchange in Late Antiquity and Beyond, here I have it, um, University of California Press uh, this past year, 2022, examines the way saint stories shared by Christians and Muslims in the Middle Ages were used to create multifaceted memories of the divine past. She's currently our faculty fellow at the Fordham University's Orthodox Christian Studies Center. And within this fellowship, she's working on her second book project, which concerns the forms and expressions of Christianity in the medieval Middle East countryside. Hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk about both of these uh, book projects as well as other projects that you're currently working on. So welcome, Rehan. Thank you so much for having me here. It's such a pleasure to um, see you, uh, virtually meet you and um, get a chance to talk with you about research projects past and present. Well, the pleasure is mine, and I'm sure everyone joining us is also excited to learn more about you and the area in which you work. So to everyone joining us today, uh, our viewers virtually, um, as usual, we'll begin with a discussion uh, for about a half hour or so, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So please don't hesitate at any time to put your questions for our guests in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll get to as many as we can before the end. Uh, and if we don't have a lot of Q&A participation, then I'm happy just to keep asking more questions. Uh, but of course, we want to open it up to our audience to be involved as well. So uh, first things first, can you start us off by telling us a little bit more about yourself as a scholar? Uh, what has shaped you intellectually? Um, what led you to your first book and to your current area of research? Of course. Um... So I, my research broadly concerns with the cultural history of the medieval Middle East, and I am particularly interested in Christianity in the Middle East, um, Christian-Muslim relations, um, and theoretical questions regarding religion, such as the making of religious communities, religious identity, um, practice, and materialities of religion. So that's the broader picture. Um, and perhaps this is expected, given that I am from Turkey, um, I am partly shaped by the legacies of that very history. Sure. But I also was privileged enough to follow my curiosities and interests. Um, out of college, I was determined to work on um, religious minorities um, in Turkey. Um, mm -hmm. And I started graduate school actually with that aspiration. And in a field trip, I went to Southeast Turkey, to Mardin and Turabdin region, um, and I immediately fell in love with um, Syriac Christianity and Syriac language, which I didn't know about <laughs> um, Syriac Christianity much before, um, before that um, trip. And since then, that was year 2008, and since then, um, I've been just learning, reading, and writing about um, Syriac Christianity and um, Middle Eastern Christianities in general. And on the way, I picked um, other, other research interests, as, as one does. Right. Um, I became, for example, increasingly more interested in the early Islamic movement um, and 
how we can conceptualize the emergence of Islam within the world of late antiquity. That was one of the questions that I um, became increasingly more interested in. Um, and the other question um, that really intrigued me was how to study Christianity under Muslim rule, especially mm. in the Middle East. This is, of course, a big question. So I was um, just curious about what questions we ask when we uh, want to study Christians under Islam. Can we go beyond, for example, questions of agency or not, um, or oppression or not? So those binaries just didn't um, make much sense to me. So I just, um, you know, um, um, wanted to learn more about those topics as well. Um, and and here we are. Um, I'm interested in both of these um, um, broadly speaking broad topics. Um, and a few years ago, when many scholars were talking and thinking about global Christianity, I also became very interested in Middle Eastern Christians in the diaspora. So I started working on um, Middle Eastern Christian communities in America and reading, I started reading the um, first um, Arabic newspaper in America that was um, published, founded and published by um, Lebanese Christians. Um, so uh, on the way, I think I, I, I picked up um, a few research interests, uh, but it's mostly concerned with um, Christianity in the Middle East, religion in the Middle East, and the um, legacies of that for the making of the modern world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's fascinating. Um, thinking of the linguistic range that you must have as well to study these various communities across different time periods. Um, so, I mean, that's that's quite uh, impressive. But also, I mean, I think one thing that um, I didn't read but was listed on the the bio of your bio for on the registration page was the way that the, the your study of the Middle Eastern Christian and Muslim communities and that interaction also impacts religious minorities in the Middle East today. So maybe you could speak a little bit more to how kind of this historical work that you're doing also is kind of interrelated to those still that first interest that you had maybe coming out of undergraduate about religious minorities in these maybe Muslim majority spaces. Absolutely. Um, I want to think that my scholarship is not isolated to history, although that might be just more of a hope um, and wish. For many of us, I think. I'm not, I know, I'm not, I'm not sure um, how much I can accomplish that. But um, when, when I study, of course, these um, historical um, contexts and communities and authors, they all focus on um, text and material culture produced by um, Christian communities and other religious minorities. Of course, there are Muslim religious minorities as well and others. So I, I am speaking about Christianity and Islam, but um, I want to just put a footnote here that it's much more diverse. And I acknowledge that diversity when it comes to religion in the medieval Middle East. Um, so whenever I study these, um, these, most of these communities are still alive, and I hope that um, the readers of my scholarship um, do find, or I, can, I hope I can raise enough curiosity to, um, um, to lead people to go to those texts and to those locations and material culture. And um, just raising awareness, I guess, is um, one um, big hope of my research. Um, and in the classroom as well, I um, focus, um, my, my teaching focuses um, mostly on um, Middle Eastern and other Eastern Christianities um, in an attempt to um, decentralize the Eurocentric narratives and focus on um, um, uh, non-European forms of Christianity. And I find Middle East um, a very rich um, case for that. Um, so um, I, I hope, again, I can inspire my students to learn more. And, uh, and I'm hoping these things are in the long run. Um, we'll change our historical narratives um, and uh, we'll change, hopefully, policy and how we uh, perceive cultural heritage and how um, somebody's museum object and um, cultural heritage management project is somebody else's um actual living culture right. um they're present and, um, and absolutely so i don't want to be a um i don't want to limit myself to museums and objects but actually want to um hopefully hopefully reach um, the people behind it 
Um, and and we can talk about that maybe in another question or in, even in another occasion. But there is so much politics involved in this that it is a very sensitive thing. Um, I um, I am from the Middle East, um, but I do not. Uh, my family does not does not come from a religious minority, mm -hmm. um, so it, it it really complicates. And I I want to stay um, aware of um, those distinctions um, and respectful of. Um, of that and still want to contribute as much as I can. Absolutely. That's that's wonderful. Um, and I think your your first book, at least, really does get into that intersection of Muslims and Christians and minorities within both of those groups, interacting as neighbors, sharing stories. So share with us just briefly um, what led you to write your first book, because we've heard kind of about your trajectory into kind of this area of of research, but a little bit more specifically, what led you to write this first book? And maybe share with us just a brief summary what it's about for those who haven't read it, but of course promised by watching this webinar that they will. And what do you hope it hope it achieves? Because you have several conclusions um, at the end about what we might take away from this, and uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, so I I started graduate school at Brown University. I started studying with. Um, Two powerhouses, Susan Harvey and Nancy Kalek. Um, and I was interested in hagiography, and I, I knew that much. And I was interested in Syriac Christianity. I knew that much, but I didn't know much beyond that. So I started becoming interested in this notion of shared stories between communities. Um, and I there's of course a huge scholarship on that decades long, if not um more than a century by this point. Um, so once I started reading that scholarship, um, certain things um, stood out for me, um, especially when it comes to stories between Christianity and Islam, which is, as I said, very well explored. But when we talk about that, we generally talk about Jesus, Mary, John the Baptist, and other biblical figures. And of course, the divine past is much more populous than that. Um, and I want to to think about the ways we can capture that broader picture. That was one big question and um, a, a, I don't want to call it problem, but an issue to be addressed um, in my um, um, in my mind at the earlier stages of that project. Um, and uh, there are various very rigorous works that focus on non-biblical holy men and women and their transmission across religious boundaries. Um, but then I had the big question mark of transmission and theorization of transmission, um, because we know very little about how stories travel and um, through which agents and in what context and um, how was it intentional? Was it ad hoc? So all of this transmission business is quite um, it's quite a big question mark. And my book does not pretend at all to answer um, that question. Uh, but I wanted to just address the complexity of the issue once again, like many others did before before me. Um, for example, just to just to give you an example, um, when scholars talk about transmission of stories between Christianity and Islam. A group suggests that there was a shared pool of tropes, literary tropes, um, expressions and themes. There was one in late antiquity and many Muslim authors, when they wrote uh, Muslim or Islamic hagiography, they just pulled tropes out of that out of that pool, uh, like the things were in the air and they just used the same expressions. And therefore the transmission was more passive and it was um, through the context itself. And therefore we cannot directly tie um, stories between Christianity and Islam. So that's one, one group. And there is of course um, a lot of truth to that, but that doesn't capture the intentionalities and the active interaction and exchange. On the other end of that spectrum, um, we have um, a group of scholars who do a great job of tracing texts from point A to point mm -hmm. B. Um, a good example, for example, is um, is um, the, the representations of Mary in the Quran. Right. 
uh, many scholars turned to the infancy gospels and they did very rigorous um, philological analysis um, and um, so, um, source criticism to see the, the potential um, relations between those two texts. Or, or corpuses. Um, so that's the other end of the spectrum. Um, and um, there is a huge gray zone in between when stories are not directly transmitted, but, but personas are transmitted. Um, many Muslim authors, for example, knew about the, the names of Christian saints and prophets, and they broadly knew the stories, even if they've never seen or heard a text um before so the persona got transmitted and they had a new story in islam and um um the stories might differ but the but the, the but the holy men and women are recognizable so that's for example that kind of transmission is not addressed um adequately so these questions and curiosities that i saw in the field um led me to the broader question. So why and how are some uh, Christian saints uh, were transmitted to Islam while others, very famous others, were not? Right. Um, so that these were my, my starting questions. And of course, on the way, I, um, I um, um, dropped some of those questions and then got, got curious with other ones. Um, but in the end, um, just to talk very briefly about what the book does, um, it um, starts with late antique Christianity, um, and I um, attempted in the very first chapter to reconstruct the, the practice of orally narrating saints' stories. Um, this is, of course, the study of orality, which, which comes with a lot of methodological um, complications, and mm -hmm. I'm not going to bore you with that, but I, 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 I tried, um, and um, I, I should showed um, examples of who might have narrated stories, in what context, to what kinds of audiences, how did um, um, audiences react and interact with narrators. So all of those um, um, social dynamics underlying the practice of storytelling, I wanted to address and reconstructed that in early in the chapter. Then the book switches um, to early Islam and brings a very famous um, late antique storyteller, um, which is who is Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, um, looking at the Quran, I reconstructed him as a late antique um, storyteller. And I think this is very important um, both to understand late antique um, storytelling um, and um, to understand early Islam and how it participates in that world. Um, again, that's one, one thing that we all say, like, early Islam's participation in late antiquity. Right. Um, um, but I, I wanted to show it through the case um, of storytelling or through the lens of storytelling, what that looks like. And this is a very, I think, precious opportunity because we have the transcript of, um, an embellished transcript, but right. nevertheless, a transcript of a preacher's communication with his, um, with his community or with various communities. So I took that as an opportunity to look at late antique storytelling um, um, in more um, depth. Um, and after the second chapter, the book transitions from late antique to the Middle Ages, and it transitions from storytelling, um, oral storytelling, to um, text and textual transmission. So there are uh, methodological shifts, and there is um, um, there is a contextual um, shift. So we moved um, further into the Middle Ages. And there I um, analyzed a number of um, case studies, um, a number of stories, um, looking at their Islamic narrations and their Christian um, narrations and try to see um, a, encounter an exchange through those examples. Um, a story of Saint Anthony of Egypt, for example, is there. A story of um, Maruta of Mefarkat, um, a fourth century bishop, is there. Um, St. George, very famously. I um, just celebrated the St. George Day, too. Yeah. I, absolutely. Um, so the book absolutely um, celebrates that um, century long, um, or participates in that um, mm -hmm. century long celebration um, of that figure. Um, and some less known figures, like um, two holy men from um, Syriac Edessa, um, their stories were narrated in Islam um, throughout 
um, 7th to uh, until the 13th century. It's very interesting to me because it's not a very well-known hypnographical like, text in Christianity, but it became very famous Islam. So I, I love tracing that story across centuries. So the book um, does that for three, three chapters. And finally, I, I tie these um, examples to address some theoretical questions. For example, um, what do these transmissions tell us about authorship and authenticity? Um, um, family as a um, as an important um, agent of transmission of knowledge um, stood out. So I reflected on that um, um, for um, a few pages, um, and um, and in general, um, I concluded with um, just pointing out that there is not one homogeneous Islamic approach to Christian hagiography, but it's very diverse. The approaches are very. Um, diverse and context-based. Um, so that's a very uh, like short running through through the book from cover to cover. Um, there are four major takeaways that I hope the reader finds in this book. Um, firstly, I, I hope I um, was clear in expressing um, that terms like biblical versus hagiographical, prophet versus saint, um, these kind of dichotomies and categorizations did not apply directly to uh, the pre-modern world. Stories of the divine past were shared, but they weren't categorized according to canonicity versus right. um, non-canonical texts. Um, so when I when we talk about hagiographical um, transmissions, it absolutely doesn't mean that they were not biblical and biblical is not. so. Um, right. the, the the categorizations. Um, were very much um, not there. And um, that's one of the um, major, um, hopefully major takeaways of, of the book. Um, secondly, the, the second major takeaway um, that I hope the reader leaves the book with um, is, is the dichotomy um, is, or the inaccuracy of the dichotomy of simple believer versus the um, theologically literate believer. Um, and in between those two poles, between the illiteracy of the simple believer and the theological literacy of clerics and the learned elite, there was, I, um, I think, a, a group of people who were very narrative literate. They knew their stories well, even if they were illiterate themselves. They knew those, their stories well, they interpreted um, their stories well, and people sought their opinions and their knowledge um, so they cultivated a, a form of prestige in their communities merely by knowing their stories very well. Um, so that really complicates that illiterate simple believer who just listens to stories and then the preacher who is theologically uh, very well knowledgeable right. and he tries to teach he tries. simple believer. He tries, <laughs> but I think I think religious experts were much more diverse, and some people just cultivated that expertise, um, just merely knowing their biblical stories and mm -hmm. geographical stories, and that was a really interesting um, and very exciting thing to reflect on for me. Um, and 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 yeah, um, and another takeaway, and I'll leave leave you with with that um, was that Christian Muslim encounter and exchange were not one time interactions and exchanges. Um, and I know in, in my scholarship, I do, and in much of, uh, in many scholars um, work, we also see this pattern where um, we um, try to reconstruct that point of interaction. And I think that's a very valuable work to reconstruct who, how, where um, enabled the transmission, which is again, very important. But when I see, and then I trace the stories, that one-time interaction is part of a, of a long conversation, and there is a, a, a um, there is a time prior to that interaction moment, and then there is the um, sometimes centuries-long negotiation with that transmitted material. So, um, another um, um, takeaway of um, the book is the continuity of those interactions, and um, um, my suggestion to not construe them as one-time. Um, interactions um, in a particular space um, and, and time. Um, 
So I will summarize this way, but I'm happy to uh, reflect on um, other mean, concepts. One thing that I took away from it was this real emphasis methodologically that you had on the oral interactions, that it wasn't just, which of course, historically we are studying through text. So there's kind of this tie back, but you even coined a term, um, hagiodio. Jesus, I'm not saying this in the correct Greek way, but um, I mean, this emphasis on the oral narration of the sainted stories, not just as you said, there's a lot of work done on around storytelling or shared stories, but this attention to that kind of oral and embodied practice. Are there anything, I mean, what can you tell us about kind of some some particular insights that we gain by attending to that type of storytelling practice as an oral and aural interaction between humans and between communities. That's not just a one-time thing, but as you even note in your conclusion, this kind of generational whole families of st storytellers, right? Who may not fit in this kind of clerical or this kind of lay uneducated space, but are in that in-between area. Right. Um, yeah, so in the earlier chapters, I, um, I, I dwell into these questions, um, and I really liked reflecting on this and thinking and writing about this. Um, and and it, 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 it is, of course, it, like I, I build on a very, very long generations of um, scholarship on orality. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying much in terms of the theory of orality. It is, of course, methodologically a very difficult um, phenomenon to study um, and, and capture. Um, and there are just to just to briefly, you know, remember um, we there are there is the oral residue in text. Um, so th that is to say, some texts at certain points sound like they are recordings of um, oral deliveries. There is, so there are questions um, surrounding our engagement with that oral residue. Then there are literary descriptions of oral narrations of stories. An author says, for example, that he went to a certain place and he listened to that story and then he's now narrating all of that. He is just telling us about that oral narration. And that's again a question whether we um, can take it as a recording um, and whether we can historically rely on that or not. And there are other methods which I um, couldn't include in my analysis, but uh, material culture um, is used to um, to reconstruct orality in antiquity. Um, manuscripts sometimes tell us um, about how certain texts were read or recited. So that's another um, material angle to to orality. Um, so th th there is a, a, a we have a quite a rich toolbox um, when it comes to studying um, orality, um, and and I I I know and many scholars of course said that before me that that was a very important. Um, um, phenomenon um, that impacted and catalyzed cultural transmission, not only cultural transmission, but teaching and learning subject formation. So um, it is quite important. Um, and with Hagio Diegesis, and don't worry about pronouncing it, I don't think anybody has pronounced it <laughs> until now. I hope the term picks up. Because It'll I'm, stick I'm, I'm once, we, once we can say I, it better. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really hope it does. And um, just if you can allow me to briefly reflect on it for a few minutes here. Um, and the, the best way for me to, I think, explain what is at stake is to just think about hagiography. Mm -hmm. um, in the Tagios Graphos, we all know this, it means writings about um, saintly people. Um, but we also know that no text was titled as a hagiography, or most texts weren't. Um, in antiquity, a story of a saint could be titled as a biography, as history, or sometimes just a story. Um, so that category, hagiography, um, is mostly a modern um, category that we use um, because just saying stories were not just mere biographies to preserve the memories of holy men and women. They were important teaching tools. They were important ways of exegesis of the Bible. Um, they were um, setting up exemplars. They were very important. Hagiography was a very important um, communication tool for antiquity and a group of scholars um, just to highlight that importance, distinguished biography from hagiography. And that's why we use it. It means something for us. It's a heuristic tool. 
Um, for the same reason, I suggested in those uh, pages of the book to distinguish just regular storytelling from storytelling about holy men and women. Um, it's of course a storytelling in the end, and people could listen with the with the aim of entertainment sometimes. So I, I'm not assuming much here, but um, I think for the world of late antiquity and the Middle Ages, um, it it makes sense and it's helpful to conceptualize a practice, um, a form of storytelling that had the um, subject of a of a hero, a holy man or woman, and it, it of course implies an audience um, and um, um, and an interaction with that audience. So in that form of storytelling with the subject of a holy man and woman, I suggested to distinguish from other forms of storytelling. That's why instead of writing about um, holy men and women, Hagios Graphos, I suggested to use um, Hagio Diegesi's narrations about um, saintly men and women. Um, that was the logic behind coining that term. Yeah, um, and as you said, yeah, methodologically, it's very um, tricky, um, but I use um, oral residue in texts, um, in a broad um, spectrum of texts um, from different languages. Um, I also use um, the literary descriptions of um, narrations and try to just approximate the practice um, um, in, in late antiquity. And um, just to, I'll, I'll give two very short examples. Um, for example, fourth century pilgrim Egeria um, goes to Jerusalem and um, Edessa and many other um, locations in the in the Middle East. And many in the audience will, of course, know this example. But wherever she goes, um, a, a monk or a bishop or some other knowledgeable person takes her around um, and and just tells the stories about those places. And she is asking questions back, um, and she's inquiring. She is comparing it to the versions she knew before. Um, so there is that interaction um, that is happening within those narrations. Again, do we take this as historical record? Do we take this as an embellished, um, maybe even imagined at certain point conversation? That is up to uh, methodological um, um, assumptions. But I think. Uh, my why 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 not um why not mm -hmm. trust her her diary um and that is for example an example of how Diego is happening as a person um is going through pilgrimage um and another and just again another short example is um Muhammad and the Quran um in the 18th chapter of the Quran uh, Muhammad tells the story of um youths who miraculously fell asleep um, um this is also known as um, the seven sleepers of Ephesus, very famous mm -hmm. story. Um, and again, the Quran is an embellished transcript of that communication. Um, but um, behind that layer of rhetoric, um, I see a preacher um, who narrated that story. And even within that passage, um, the Quranic narrator um, says, people say they were five or some say they were six. Uh, mm. Don't debate about the details. So that to me is such an important glimpse mm -hmm. into Hagio Diegesi. It's like a preacher is here preaching and then he is reminding his audience that, you know, different versions of the story mm -hmm. um, and don't don't debate because there is no end to debate. It, it also is kind of a hermeneutical thing there too, right? Like these, the number of the, the people that were sleeping is maybe less or less relevant to some, you know, bigger kind of theological takeaway or some other main point that the preacher or Muhammad is making. So, you know, there's kind of, Absolutely. let's not argue about these smaller things. So it also gives you an evaluation of what they thought was important in these texts. Absolutely. Um, but it also says, like, it also implies that people were debating. And yes. sometimes, of course, we have um, records of um, many people debating with Muhammad about details of these stories. Um, so this is, again, a Hagio Diegesi session um, captured in a couple passages um, of, of the Quran um, for, for my analysis. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. But I'm happy to, of course, debate about this. And this is um, um, this raised a lot of questions. Um, it, it, it really depends on what kind of methodological and theoretical assumptions um, we have. I um, choose to trust the text 
per perhaps not individual texts and individual stories and those particular um, narrations, but if we read these texts cumulatively, we can actually say a lot about the late antique world and the storytelling um, in the world of late antiquity. Absolutely. And if, if not, I think a lot of historians would be in trouble that, you know, how could we speak to a historical record that's so varied, but that kind of consensus and overwhelming evidence helps make those, those claims. Um, a lot of your, your chapters and your work, um, both in this project and I believe in your current work, um, deals with this kind of in-between spaces between Muslim and Christian interactions, um, and particularly how Christian figures then appear in Muslim sources. Can you tell us a little bit about what changes, because they're not just wholeheartedly adopted, and we see this, you know, differently with holy men or monks appear slightly different uh, compared to other saints or, you know, so tell us a little bit about what shifts, what, what kind of are the the stylized changes that the Muslim authors and storytellers do when they use these figures? Um, yeah, so there wasn't one Islamic homogenous way of approaching Christian saints and sanctity and hagiography. Um, and all of those transmissions and shifts were really context-based, um, location-based, and uh, based on the author's um, intentions and knowledge. Um, so I know that's a very political and very broad answer, but that's my um, entry to that, to that question. Um, and um, so the, I identified five factions, Christian um, holy men, um, or, or Christian saints, cults, and uh, persona and stories fulfilled in Islam. We can we can name more, but I focused on these five. They were used as um, the stories were used as historical information um, for to explain what happened before Islam. And in those cases, um, most of the time, the Christian saints um, stayed as Christian saints because the hagiographical knowledge was used to for for historical reconstruction. Um, two. Um, Christian saints were sometimes used or portrayed as members of the Muslim community that predated Muhammad. Um, in those cases, their titles are erased generally, um, and their stories become much less Christian. All the biblical quotations are taken out, and um, there is almost nothing um, Christian about the saints anymore. And they're explicitly referred to sometimes as Muslims and Imams of their communities. So there is a lot, they sometimes quote from the Quran. Um, so when the purpose is to um, actually make them part of the Muslim community, um, then they become Muslim. Muslim. Um, yeah. in, in Another group, um, they they are used as exemplars of universal piety and wisdom. Um, put together, for example, Sufi saints, um, and in those cases, again, um, they they their Christianity is is irrelevant. Um, I don't see a rigorous erasure in those cases. They are. Sometimes Saint Anthony, for example, is placed among Muslim Sufi saints um, as a Christian saint, um, but they, they again muted, but they stay Christians. Um, and in another category, um, many of those stories are used um, to to interpret the Quran. Um, especially some stories in the Quran have. Um, have um, anonymous characters or, um, or interesting events, and they are explained um, with the help of Christian hagiography and, um, and uh, biblical literature. Um, and in those cases, they again become um, Muslims and their Christianness is de-emphasized. Um, so depending on what, what purpose, the, purpose um, yeah. the, the, the saint is fulfilling, um, there was a degree of Islamization and a degree of erasure. Hmm. That's fascinating to hear how the, you know, different authors will do that differently, but also that we see some kind of, you're able to identify, you know, five or so patterns of, or different uses that shape how these figures appear. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, I'd like to turn maybe to your second, um, your second project and hear a little bit about that and maybe how it ties into your first one, or maybe it's something, you know, it's in a different direction. Uh, before I do, I'll remind those joining us that if you have questions uh, for our guests, please put them in the Q&A. 
and we'll get to them uh, as many as we can. All right, so tell me about your, you're currently a research fellow at um, Fordham's Orthodox Christian Studies Center uh, for the year, which is wonderful, which means you get to work on a second book project. So tell us about that uh, and how you came to that project. I'm really very thankful to um, to be able to take this year off and work on this project about which I'm so, so excited. Um, it is related in, in a sense that it still is um, concerned with the medieval Middle East, um, but it is more Christianity focused this time. Um, I am exploring um, forms and expressions of Christianity in the medieval Middle Eastern countryside. Um, and the questions I, um, I ask, um, some of them at least, are, for example, like what, what, first of all, what can we say about not only Christianity, but religion in general in the countryside? Mm -hmm. um, and this is a, quite a big question because when we talk about Middle Eastern Christianities, um, we most of the time think about theological communities, theologically bound communities. And that's because most of the material, be it buildings or inscriptions or our uh, texts come from urban centers where um, clerical regalia is displayed in processions. And um, um, again, like clerics and theologians produce theology and there are these churches um, that shape the landscape of cities. So our understanding of Middle Eastern Christianity is very urban centric and is very theology centered. I'd say and that's probably I, the case for, for most of our understanding of Christianity, not necessarily just in the Middle East, but I mean, it's definitely understudied and it's, you know, people are moving to this kind of more lived religion. And, and sometimes that does mean rural, but sometimes it's still thinking in these kind of urban dominant discourse kind of areas. Totally fair. This is not a problem endemic to um, the Middle East studies at all. But there are, I think, bigger um, stakes here because because of those historical reconstructions, I think in the West, there is still that understanding that Middle Eastern Christians are quaint, they mm. are a little too much concerned with theology, um, and perhaps that is the case, and that's, 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 I'm not saying that's a problem, but there were so many diverse expressions of Christianity that uh, needs to be brought to the fore, just to change those, if not nothing else, just to change those perceptions, right? When we think about these, like, whenever there is any, um, display of or representation of orthodoxy in the Middle East or orthodox Christians in the Middle East. There is a cleric um, in really beautiful regalia. Um, there is that image of um, Middle Eastern Christianities as a, a different kind of Christianity that doesn't comfortably tie to the European narratives. Um, of course, it, it ties to um, nationalization um, language. It ties to so many political um, 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 political policy and political discourse. Um, so the, 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 the stakes are quite um, higher in my understanding for um, the Orthodox communities in the Middle East. Um, and that was one of the um, motivating um, factors um, to start this project. Um, I, um, I constantly I, I, I plan to divide the book into um, six chapters, each focusing on a demographic group. Um, I do not want to, for example, focus on clerics, but I want to open up with mater familias and see what um, the, the powerful female figures of families did in, um, um, in families who were based in the countryside. Um, another um, chapter focuses on um, the soldier, um, which is an underexplored category for religion. Uh, we know a lot about armies and a lot about sure. military tactics, but um, there's um, an important trope in Christian historiography mm -hmm. and hagiography about how soldiers relate to um, religious communities, and I want to explore more about that. Another one um, is a, a chapter dedicated to, to, to healers be them monks or nuns or sometimes freelance healers um, that of course includes sorcerers and um, um, other religious experts um, so I'm, I'm still um, you know playing with the chapters uh, but yeah. I want to focus on people and uh, and and see what I can say um, there is very important work um, uh, decent work done on on this um, by Jack Tanus and Philip Wood um, and others. So this is not a completely under um, explored territory, uh, but I have, um, um, I, I have 
picked an angle of religion and what we can say about religion. And that, of course, includes um, believers, but also the disbelievers. Um, sure, yeah. Um, and how, how that worked, um, simple believer is a category we started thinking and talking about, but I want to also see whether we can say anything about simple non-believers. Mm -hmm. um, so these are very much at the, uh, in my mind all day these days and these that's, months. Um, that's, I that sounds very it. exciting. <laughs> Yeah, very Thank exciting. You. You um, and and also that you get a lot more of this kind of religious diversity, even within maybe a particular um, religious confession. So even within, let's say, Orthodox Christianity, when you move to the rural communities, you might have a lot more variety or different levels, different people in places of authority, opposed to maybe the clerics, like you said, in the city. Um, what kind of, can you tell us what kind of sources you're looking at? So your first book focused so much on sacred stories, both written and then also exploring kind of what the oral traditions behind those and lineages those might be and how that might be understood. What are you looking at, again at sacred stories in the rural countryside or are you looking at other types of um, sources? Um, so I'm reading and exploring um, uh, geography um, uh, and historiography these days. Um, the Chronicle of Suklin, for example, has been such a rich um, source for me. I, I love every page, reading every page of it. It's mm -hmm. an eighth century Syriac chronicle um, and one of the rare witnesses of the Islamic conquests in the countryside. Um, so um, historiography, mostly local. Um, and um, as you said, local hagiographies, um, there are certain saints' lives that are not very well known, but they um, seem to have been written and circulated mostly in the Middle Eastern um, countryside in monastic centers, but I'm, um, I'm assuming um, village folks and other people also had access to these stories and narrated these stories. So a geography is useful as well. Um, and um, inscriptions is another very important um, source for me. There is a um, group of um, currently unpublished Syriac inscriptions from 12th century northern Mesopotamia, and they commemorate a, a, a family of builders. Um, these were Christian um, family of builders, and their signature is on multiple buildings. Um, and, um, and they also seem to have um, worked for Muslim as well as Christian um, um, households. Um, so this seems to be a very prestigious local family who made a living by uh, building the entire village, literally, um, and their memories are, um, are preserved in um, beautiful Syriac inscriptions, um, commemorating them and praising them. Um, so with examples um, of this sort, um, I um, want to see whether or what we can say about um, family and um, family religion, and as you said, um, non non theological um, expressions of religion and uh, what it means to be a religious community anyway, and who makes the community and um, who who adheres and identifies with that community. So, trying to answer all of those questions through um, historiography, hagiography, inscriptions, and um, material. Um, culture. Um, I um, I worked on a, a church. Uh, I surveyed it many years ago and recently published about it, which um, has a Syriac um, inscription commemorating probably the founders of, of the church, but it dates it with uh, Islamic calendar. Um, mm -hmm. And the decorations are also really fascinating, although um, they are very simple. Um, so through those examples of architecture um, and um, of both architectural types, but also architectural decoration, um, I am going to triangulate um, religious communities. That's, that's fascinating. And it makes me wonder too, I mean, in, in the areas that you're studying, do we have um, primarily homogenous religious communities in these rural areas? Are they, or do we have more kind of multi-faith or, you know, Muslim mayor, but then the people, I mean, what is your sense of kind of the makeup of the spaces that you're exploring uh, for this project? Yeah, it's very, the religious landscape is very diverse. Um, and to the extent that without talking about intersectionality, we cannot talk about religious community right. um, <laughs> because class um, played very important role. Race 
played a very important role. Um, yes, theological um, um, positions and the following of certain clerics were important, but that wasn't a one-sided power dynamic at mm. all. People could um, get rid of their own clerics. They could just not accept them. We have no. so many examples of those um, instances. So authority was very precarious. Um, and um, all of this was, as all of this was happening within Christian communities, their relations to local Muslim elite, who could have been temporary or permanent in their cities, their relations with um, the city, um, and how um, those two locations spoke to each other, just created a very diverse and very complex society too, because we tend to think, at least I used to um, think, that the further away you go from cities, the simpler the religion becomes. Right. Um, but that's not, that's not no. it doesn't look simple at all. Um, so I want to um, just address that question too. Like the countryside religion is not necessarily the simpler, uh, more utilitarian um, and less articulate forms of religion, not, not at all. Not at all, that's fascinating. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, did or in the Q and A, did you see differences or patterns as one moved from the Middle East to distant geographic areas such as Spain or Persia? Not sure if that's something that you've explored, but speak to that if you have. Yeah, no, thank you so much for it. Of course, Middle East um, is our our construct, and mm -hmm. um, um, I um, try to keep it as uh, broad as uh, possible. For example, I do talk about South Arabia, if that is um, Yemen yeah. and South Arabia, Yemen, if yeah. that is um, within, um, within our understanding of the boundaries of the Middle East. Persia is a little bit there, and obviously there is so much transmission between these um, locations like Persia, India, um, Ethiopia, um, and um, the Middle East. Um, I couldn't go as far as Spain, I think I have a brief mention of mm -hmm. a scholar from Spain. I can't remember now. Um, but um, but 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 yes, the answer is absolutely the Middle East um, is um, our uh, a category and a geography we created. Um, um, the the understanding of geography was um, quite different in um, the areas that I uh, in the communities that I study, um, and there is a, a lot of transmission between um, those geographies and what we call as the Middle East. Um, for example, Alexander Dossier, a story of Alexander, um, seems to have been reiterated in the Quran in a way that is informed by the Syriac tradition. Um, and then we have later Christian, um, Ethiopian Christian um, narrations of the Alexander story. And that seems to have been um, transmitted through Islam. Um, so the Islamic interpretation gets reincorporated into the um, Alexander hagiographical um, dossier in Ethiopia. Um, so the transmission is really multi-directional and, um, um, and quite, quite complex. Um, that's why I think um, a discussion of geography and um, um, boundaries is really um, very, um, very much a necessity or as a, as a um, forward in any of these um, works on cultural transmission. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just amazing how, you know, our conception of space, physical space and geography is so different from that of the ancient world. Um, and how that shapes our scholarship too when we encounter names or terms and these types of things that really shifts kind of our perspectives. Um, so we have time maybe for one last uh, question, which is, how, can you tell us a little bit about how your research uh, might speak to contemporary present day Orthodox Christian communities? Uh, what should their takeaway be from your research uh, in terms of, you know, thinking about this particular audience uh, hosting the webinar? Um, and you you spoke a little bit to this at the beginning, but now that we've heard more about your research, maybe um, bring us back to that space one more time. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm, I, I should emphasize that I would never even pretend or um, yeah, intend to teach or say anything to um, Orthodox Christian communities about their own culture. Yeah. I'm just very thankful that I get to study their text mm -hmm. and material culture. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my entry of course. <laughs> to that yeah. answer. Mm -hmm. um, but all of the texts that I study are produced by um, Syriac and Greek Orthodox communities of mostly of, um, of Middle East. And um, um, I hope that I can encourage um, some people 
helpful to go explore those texts further and perhaps produce translations and and just put that cultural production in the for um in the foreground mm-hmm. of scholarship but also um, um cultural heritage today um and similarly especially with the new project um i am focusing on um, buildings and landscapes and um and inscriptions um and other objects that were again produced by these communities and i hope to um if it is in ruins i hope to perpetuate the memories if it is still an active place i hope to um, impact policy in a way to raise more funding for the uh, preservation of these um buildings so um um in in those cases again this might just be a hope at the at the stage uh but i know it is not um because um, i started building a, a photograph archive of the buildings I photographed about a decade ago in the Turabdin region, Syria for those churches and monasteries, and it is currently a publicly available archive. Um, and um, um, and I'm, I continue to build um, that as part of this new project. Um, so I, um, I, the encouragement of other scholars, um, journalists and policy makers hopefully um to 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 know more about um uh, these cultures and um and their place in the modern world is uh my my ultimate dream um um because yeah i i think it is it is really important to tie all of these historical discussions to the modern world we keep saying in our scholarship like it's very important to understand the history to understand today, but what? Right. How do we translate all of that historical work to modern day, um, uh, modern day politics, policy, rhetoric, and conceptualizations of the other conceptualizations mm-hmm. of religion? So these are quite big questions, and I again, I don't intend at all to um, or pretend at all to find the answers, but I hope I can um, contribute a little bit to um to um the broader questions about how um the modern world is made and what we take for granted yeah. and um especially in the west um how do we perceive um and and construe um race and difference mm-hmm. and um and um other other things that make us in a way um and i um, i just want to return to the question of um the role of the middle east um in the making of the west oh, that's excellent and i think i mean you mentioned once the challenge you have with your students presenting them this this area of thought and the world and history to disrupt their kind of eurocentric view of christianity of religion of you know the pre-modern world uh and so the work you're doing is so important not just kind of intellectually but also as you said you know for present day communities policymakers uh and preserving and better understanding that heritage so we really appreciate um both of these projects and um the other work that you're doing in the kind of diaspora uh with the levity's um newspaper as well so we look forward to reading your next book as well. We really appreciate you taking the opportunity uh, to share uh, all this wonderful, rich insight about your work and your own intellectual journey with us today. So um, thank you. Thank you you, um, to everyone who joined us. um, And thank you especially to Rehan. Uh, As always, you'll be able to uh, watch a recording of this webinar on the Center's um, YouTube page, along with our previous webinars. And we look forward to uh, continuing this um, series uh, later on this year. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.